Dzień dobry. Jeszcze Polska. Nasz genewa. Póki my żyjemy. That's the Polish national anthem. Very smart of you. Talk. That's Talk. all I can do. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. And so now I guess we'll have Kimi Kagan. Na dużym ekranie zadebiutowała w wieku 17 lat w wyczce Ottona Preningera. Do tej pory zagrała w ponad 50 filmach pod okiem takich reżyserów jak John Borman, John Burman, Richard Lester czy Premian de Palma. Z uznaniem krytyków spotkały się jej kreacje w bilecie do nieba, foto Monika Walur czy nagrodzonym złotym niedźwiedziem w Berlinie autorze widmo Romana Polańskiego. Jednak najwięcej nagród oraz popularność na całym świecie przyniosła jej kreacja Samanty Jones w kultowym serialu ABO Sejc w Wielkim Mieście oraz dwóch filmach pod tym samym tytułem. Za tę rolę została uhonorowana Złotym Globem. Poza tym zgromadziła jeszcze trzy nominacje do tej nagrody i pięć nominacji do Emmy. A razem z przyjaciółkami z planu otrzymała również cztery nominacje i dwie nagrody od amerykańskiej Gildi Aktorów Filmowych. W tym roku Kim Kadgal powraca do seriali telewizyjnych w roli producenta wykonawczego i zarazem gwiazdy kanadyjskiej adaptacji brytyjskiego przeboju Censuricji. Kim Cattrall, ladies and gentlemen. Dzień dobry. Um, welcome to Krakow, you expert Polish speaker, you. Congratulations. No, it's, no, it's, the only reason I, I know any Polish at all is um, my, uh, my husband, my, my ex-husband, <laughs> who was from Krakow. So, yes, yes, yes. And he spoke about it. Uh, we were together um, during the Iron Curtain, and uh, so he never got to, he left Poland at 16 um, and never came back. Uh, so when I knew him, it was, he couldn't go back to Poland. But I remember him speaking about it with tremendous love and uh, passion. And what's it like for you being here, the, hearing this place you got to hear about for so long? Oh, it's beautiful. I, I really, I, I rode a bike all around your beautiful city yesterday. It was, uh, I, I'm very happy to have the weather as good as it is. And um, I went to the, to the castle and uh, then that bike ride and going to the salt mines and, um, and just walking around the city. It's a very intimate, beautiful place. The main square is particularly gorgeous. I've been tweeting about it. If you tweet, please follow me at, at Kim Cattrall. <laughs> I do answer. It's me, not someone else. Yes, please tweet now that you know. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, because you've spent a lot of time in the intimate cities so you can walk around it in London and yes. New York. You must like that energy of being able to move around at your own pace, don't you? I do. Um, New York pace is exhausting. Um, I, I love New York. I moved to New York at 16, and uh, I didn't know anyone. I was going to theater school, and it was quite a big difference because I had never really spent any time in America. I was born in Liverpool, England, and I grew up in Canada, and I went back and forth mostly between England and Canada. So uh, Western Canada, right? Western Canada, Vancouver Island is where I grew up. Uh, with a population of less than 5,000. And then I moved to New York, and it was a population of over 5 million. <laughs> so uh, luckily, you know, the great thing about theater school for me was the people I met and what I learned, but also the other students. And uh, they showed me around New York. And they're still my friends today. They're still, we're still very close, all of now, us. Where did you live in New York when you first lived there? When I first lived there, I lived in a place called the Parkside Evangeline, which was run by the Salvation Army, and it was a young women's residence. Wow. And I had a, a room about as big as this coffee table with a tiny bed and a little window, and that was my world. That was it, that in theater school. And what stuff were you doing when you were training? What was the first play you did, uh, do you remember? Uh, the first play ever I did was a play called Piffle, It's Only a Sniffle, and I played a cold germ. I'm sorry, that's so beautiful. A cold germ. <laughs> How did and you find the inner cold germ in yourself <laughs> exactly. to play? I wasn't exactly a method actress then. 
Um, I remember making myself a costume with wings and running around, you know, and having this big feather where I tickled everyone under the nose. But it was, it was really fun, and um, I got a scholarship from my school to go to a summer school for uh, acting. And I took the course, and I had a fantastic time. And the teacher said, I think you should pursue this. You have, you have talent, I think. So I, went, I got a scholarship to go the next year, but uh, my great-grandmother was ill in Liverpool, so we went to England to visit her. And uh, I met a great aunt of mine, not a blood relation. She married my great uncle. And she uh, taught acting. And she said, why don't you stay a little bit longer than your vacation here, or your trip here in Liverpool, and why don't you take this Lambda exam, which is the London Academy of Music and, and Drama. And I took it and I got honors from this exam. And I did a piece from Shakespeare, I had to do a mime, and I think I did a scene from, oh, a Lillian Hellman play, which I didn't understand at all. Which, which was Children's Hour? Uh, no, I think it was Children's Hour. No, 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 actually it wasn't. It was- Little um, Foxes? No, it wasn't Little Foxes. It was, um, oh, this wonderful, mm, maybe it was Children's Hour. Maybe it was Children's Hour, yes. Which is, uh, at, at 11, 12, I couldn't grasp what was really going on. It's about two women who are accused of having a lesbian relationship. <laughs> so I didn't really know what was going on. But I guess I did puck better than that um, from a Midsummer Night's Dream, so I did well. So then it, it became clear that what I, what I loved doing, I could possibly make a livelihood at and continue to do. You said something to interesting to me a few minutes ago that you liked the idea still of playing other people, of escaping. Yes. And did that appeal to you even at that age, just playing the cold germ and moving on to Puck? I mean, yes. did you connect to those things? I did. I enjoyed reading. And what I enjoyed about reading was when I put the book down, I could imagine where the story was going to go next. And the most exciting thing for me was not knowing where the story was going to go. And that still is how I like to work today, uh, is playing a character who takes you in a direction you didn't always anticipate. Um, and that helped me very much playing Samantha Jones in Sex and the City, because I played a woman who had an amazing appetite. <laughs> and really, that's the <laughs> An amazing effort. Okay. And, yeah. you know, my imagination, because I'd never, other than Madeleine Kahn, I'd never really seen an actress make comedy out of uh, sexuality before. And you're thinking about Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles, yes. Many of the films that yeah. she did. Young Frankenstein, exactly. you know. Yeah, even High Anxiety. All these exactly. These women who were kind of overtaken by their appetites. Yes, yes. Like a fever almost, yes. yes. Um, so I think that that, that uh, quality that I have of um, being daring, being unexpected, and, and the audience not knowing has, um, has been something that has helped me with the characters that I've played. And I think it brings in the audience because when you know something, I think you get complacent. It's when you don't know something that you get engaged. You have my attention. Then how do you play somebody for so long? Because you play that character for a good long chunk of your career. And how do you continually find surprise in playing somebody like that? Well, that's where imagination comes in. You know, the writer would write, Samantha falls on the bed. And I thought, oh my God, how many times have I fallen on the bed playing Samantha? So each time I would try... There's a montage of all the times yes, you've not kidding. I know, I know, I know. That's not even a third of it, believe me. Um, I think what it does is, is lets my imagination, it becomes a challenge to make it new and fresh. But... Uh, apropos of that, I mean, does that get a little bit daunting after a while? Yes. Somebody you get to know so well? Yes. And then, because you got that point, the work has to be still finding the surprise in it, though, yes. doesn't it? But I am a theater actress, and every night I go in front of an audience, and I'm telling a story. And each night, people say, how can you play a character every single night? Or how can you play a character for 14 years? And it's, it's really, for me, the challenge is keeping it fresh. Every night, I try and do something a little bit different. And every night, or every time we film, I find something new. I try to, as much as possible. Because then you're engaged. 
you're engaged as the actor, as a creative need. Because I was thinking one of the first times I saw you was in the movie in which you terrified me, uh, Ticket to Heaven. Oh, wow. You are a cinema buff. <laughs> it's yeah. a great performance, and oh, you should tell the audience a little bit. I mean, it's an, an entirely Canadian production, too. It's you and... and, 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 and uh, Nick Mancuso. Nick Mancuso. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, you play a character who... I think, for me, is a key to a lot of things you've done. We think you're one thing, you turn out to be something else. Yes, yes. Uh, I played uh, a programmer in... Um, Ticket to Heaven is about a young man who gets uh, brainwashed and he becomes part of the Moonies. And it was based on a book... True story. A, a true story. And I play a girl called Ruthie, and she's head of the brainwashing camp. So I played a brainwasher. And uh, she was fanatic just a fanatic energy Initially, she's energy very ball. seductive. Oh, yes. She used everything, anything and everything. But she's very religious, very sound. She felt that she was saving the character that Nick Mancuso played, saving his soul. So it was for a greater good that she did everything. Seduced him, but not physically. Yes. Uh, but what initially we think is going to be beautiful. She's very flirty. She's using her body in this. Yes. She's a siren to yes. pull him in. Yes. And then once she gets him in, we get to see this burning ambition in her eyes. Oh, yes, yes. She's almost like a frenetic, uh, zealot t uh, cheerleader. You know, she's really a... She wears these overalls, which are not very sexy, and she's playing all these games, and um, it, the energy for it was... You know, she's, she's really whipping you into this frenzy. Oh, when you're in that chant, frenzy. which is basically you know, to drive any sort of yes. outside choo -choo, thought choo -choo, out of your choo -choo, head. Choo-choo, yay, yay, pow. Choo-choo, choo-choo, yay, yay, pow. And it became like um, a, a, a trance. It really was. And, and also the, the people that they were brainwashing, they weren't allowed to have any protein. So they're sort of existing on this kind of, uh, not, not without any center. Their sugar and starch. There's no brain food. Uh, it, no brain food. No, no. So they're susceptible to a lot, and um, you know it was a, it was a wonderful film to be part of, directed by Ralph Thomas, who was uh, not a fictional director. He'd done a lot of documentaries, and he was a Baptist also. Yeah, he was very religious, and um, his his family had been actually missionaries in Africa. Um, so he came from a totally, feeling a totally different way about religion, first of all, um, but also about making this film as real as possible. He shot it in sequence. Because Nick had to lose all the weight for it. Yes, yes, the lead character loses 30 pounds through the course of the film, so he had to start off looking relatively normal and end up being emaciated, yeah. But I, again, just I'm thinking about so many of these performances. I mean, even we work with John Carpenter, and yes. we think you're one kind of person, but you have to sort of take control, and you do. And one of the things I was saying to you before we started that I've always have been impressed by with you is your characters are always these full-bodied people. I mean, you use your body in its entirety, and that kind of physical commitment really matters to you, doesn't it? It does. To me, it's... Um it's one of those aha moments. I have an aha, I mean, I get it. I get what drives this person. Uh, I get that sometimes through physicality, particularly in a film that showed last year at the festival uh, called Meet Monica Velour. I wanted to play this character because I felt I wanted to portray the underbelly of being sexualized. Because playing Samantha Jones, it was a beautiful sexuality. It was very attractive. Um, Actually very sunny. I mean, she's... Very positive. The, yeah, unlike the other women in the show, she's not, she doesn't suffer over No, her. no, no. She suffers when she's in love. Yes. But not when she's... She's terrified might. of intimacy, really. She can have physical intimacy, but she can't really open her heart. She, she controls. Exactly. Well, she's a PR executive. What do PR people do? They control. <laughs> so, yes, but this character had no control and no hope, no options. It was and the antithesis of Samantha Jones, uh, but also being sexualized, objectified, which I have been as an actress most of my life, and I think that's partly because, you know, I look a certain way. 
And also when I was coming up as an actress, just to pay the rent, there were certain jobs like Porky's, which was fun to do, but a very physicalized and objectified um, character. You basically, in an, you take what's an, an anecdotal piece and make a real person out of it. Try to, yes, as much as possible. And it's yes. funny you mentioned that. I can almost see that character growing up to be Samantha because she's very much about that appetite. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You see what I mean? That's, yes, that's sort of that connection? I do, I do. yes, yes. But, but good, back to Monica, I was really, Monica Valour, impressed by it. She didn't know what to do with her hands. Yeah. That was a really interesting note to play. Yeah. Talk about how you, you found that. Well, do you mean in the sense of... Uh, not knowing who she is, not really owning the spaces. No, she, she was broken down. And I think from a very early age, uh, she was taught that she was worthless except for her physical attributes. The way she looked, how she performed on camera on these porn films. And the physicality was of somebody beaten down. I mean, she's living in a trailer park fighting for the custody of her daughter from this really schlubby, horrible husband of hers who um, is in, she's in court with. And this young boy appears and he, he has idealized her. He's only seen her films, he doesn't know who she is. So she's, she's really, uh, she's also, she's an alcoholic, you know. She's snorting cocaine, she's smoking drugs, she's smoking. She she's doesn't... She's self-medicating, yeah. She's, uh, she, her heart's broken. Her spirit has been broken for many, many years. And a lot of porn stars that I interviewed in, from the 70s, which Monica Valour was from the 70s, they never got rich. They were paid maybe 500 bucks on a daily rate. They never had residuals. They never had any protection. And that's, so she has nothing. You know, she wasn't, uh, she, she was not a producer, an executive producer or anything. So her, her, she has no hope, she has no options. But I thought, I have to find something in her that is hopeful. And that became her child. That became the thing about Monica that I could make her as real and as truthful and as ugly and pathetic as she really was in so many ways. But the thing that she had that was positive about her was her love and her commitment to being a mother, the best she could be. What was uh, I found unique about that character, and I wonder if this is what appealed to you about her, mm -hmm. is she's one of the first characters you played, um, I just watching all these scenes to get ready for this, who wasn't informed by optimism. You, find, you have a way of playing these characters who have this sort of, they're leaning forward for experience almost. Yes. And she was not that by any means. No. And I wonder if that's what attracted you to playing that. It also did, but I was very much... Uh, you know, it was a great part, and it was a scary part to play. Uh, I had to gain, I gained 25 pounds to play Monica, and I loved it. <laughs> I love to eat. It's one of my great passions. And I've been on a diet for most of my life because I love to eat so much. Um, and I have to exercise because I love to eat so much, but... Um, to play this character, to just be something else. You know, it's a, it's, a great, it's a great challenge, and it's also fun to get outside of playing one thing and become something else and inhabit it completely. It also puts every worry that you have about your real life on hold. <laughs> so you don't have to face your real life. You just completely, that's the greatest thing about being an actor. You don't have to worry about taxes or death for a while. You just have to worry about what the character's going through, what the character wants. Yeah, but come on now. You also have to worry about being true to this character. That's got to be, I mean, you, aren't you kind of trading one set of worries for another to some extent? Yes, but there's a beginning, middle, and end to Monica Valore's troubles. Mine continue. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not troubles, they're just challenges, you know. They're, I try to think of it positively. But, you know, um, I'm, my heart can't get broken while I'm playing Monica Velour. She, I'm obsessed with her. It becomes, it becomes an obsession with, with you. I think it, it has to for a period of time. It's a very... It feels almost like a monk that you, you are when you're playing these roles, that you have to take on a different discipline. And the discipline on a daily basis when I do a play is every day is about getting to the theater. That's what my whole day is about. And my one day off is about sleeping. 
but it's like that with filming. You know, my whole day is about trying to, especially in filming more than theater, because you get to have a rehearsal space in theater, a time to experiment. On film, your experimentation is from take to take. And hopefully you have a director who is, doesn't want you to do the same thing, all three or four takes that you do. He wants you to have variety so he can look in the editing suite and understand that there's different things on different takes that he can use to make the story clearer. So it's an immense amount of concentration, especially in film, because you wait for a long period of time before the technical parts are in place, and then you have to hit your mark literally hit your mark as much as possible every time, which takes a tremendous amount of concentration. So I've got to wonder, though, especially because this gleam, so many of these characters you play to have in their eyes, if at some point it's almost like possession. Uh, Can be, things, yes. Yeah. Is that, does that be. happen for you sometimes, sir? Yes, especially with a play. Sure. Because I think there's... Um, everyone knows the dialogue so well, everyone knows the story so well, so it's really like... Um, it's like flying. I use that metaphor when we spoke earlier today. I think sometimes acting, and the way I choose to look at it, is I feel that I'm on a cliff. And I look down, and I see the bottom of the cliff. And I want to go down there. Not that I want to kill myself, but I want to fly. And I want to land, because I know when I land, I'll be somewhat different in some way from what I've learned of playing that character. And what I've learned about myself when I'm happiest in life is when I'm learning. That, that to me is the best place to be. Not when I feel confident and I know everything. It's not always a comfortable place to be a student uh, because you feel vulnerable and people want to give you, uh, you know, qualities that I don't want to possess. You know, I've... How do you mean? I don't want to be the expert in the room. I don't want to have the answers. I want to ask the questions, but I want to find the answers. And the answers keep changing for me as I, as I change. And that's the great thing about getting older. Well, you said something interesting too, that a lesson you got from Jack Lemmon in the first thing I saw you do, which was the adaptation of the play Tribute uh, yes. as a film. Mm. Tell the audience what, what Jack Lemmon told you when you asked. Uh, I asked Jack Lemmon, I wanted to have longevity in my career as an actress, as an actor, as an artist, maybe. Um, and I said to him, you've had a career since you started acting from theater school. He'd been doing it for about 30 years at that yeah, point. Yeah, 30, 40 years. And I said, how, how do you have longevity? And he said, you take, you take jobs, kiddo, that scare you. And uh, I never forgot that. And recently I worked with Kevin Spacey at uh, last year at the Old Vic doing a Tennessee Williams play, which scared me. And every time I get a script, like Monica Velour, scared me. Um, working with Roman Polanski scared me. <laughs> you know? um, Was he scary in the abstract just before you even... Because, yes. Because of his reputation, because of who he is. He's larger than life. Absolutely. And he's one of the greatest film directors that there ever was and ever will be. I mean, he's brilliant. He's a genius. And I think, well, what will I have to contribute? Will I be good enough? Will I... Will he like my work? Will he appreciate what I've done? Um, will I be part of the family? You know, all of those things. It's sometimes, always really, not just sometimes, the first day of work is like the first day of school. And you're six years old again, and you want to grab your mother's hand and say, take me away, I'm terrified. Um, but it's always a chance that you take, you know? You never get, you never, and I never want to become the person who says, oh, I know what this is about. And I've, I've worked with those kind of actors. And I think, oh, well, that's too bad because you're cutting yourself off from what you don't know. That's my experience. But also there gets to be, and this must be anathema to you, a complacency in some of those actors that you're talking about. Yeah. Where I, that comfort becomes key to them rather than the fear that can make things interesting. Yes, yes, it's true, it's true. But that's, you know, there's, there's many different ways to be an actor, so this is my way. It must have been kind of 
great for you because there have been so many great performances by women in Polanski films. You must yes. have been hungry for that. Yes, yes. He, it's, uh, he's, he, I like to think of him as, um, he's, very, he's very much a family man. Most of his crew have worked with him from the very beginning. And that says everything to me. That's relationship, that's family. That means there's a shorthand. And you're invited to become part of that family for that period of time. So when you're not working, you want to be on the set. Because uh, I want to see him work. And he's a perfectionist, and he's not easy. He demands a lot. But it's worth it. It's really worth it. When a character like Monica Fuller, though, just grabs you by the gut, is it hard to let it go afterwards? I mean, is it tough to walk away because you got this physical vestige of you've gained the weight? Yeah. But also, it's <laughs> that was so harder to take off than it was to put on. Believe me. Was um, it? Yeah, dieting is tough, uh, especially when you like to eat. But um, I, yeah, it was. I find that with every part I play, yeah. I I live with them. They live with me. That's why it's easier to be single. <laughs> you guys writing all this down, it's easier to be single. It is. Because you, you bring Monica Valore home, it could be rough, you know. Um, and my voice uh, changes. For, I lowered, I went to a vocal coach and I You lowered. sounded older, as a matter of fact. I was, I was like, it was here, I was down there, you know, because she was... It's just lost and fucked up and, you know. Uh, so it's all of that was, was part of it. And Samantha was fantastic. It was always up, you know. Um, and uh, Emily Bly was very cold and, and reserved, very quiet and antiseptic and removed. Um, so all of those things, this, these, are, these are wonderful gifts that you have as an instrument. Why would you not employ them to play a different kind of character? Uh, so yes, they, they are challenges and they're hard to let go because, you know, you, they become part of your fabric for a while playing um, Princess Cosmonopolis in um, Tennessee Williams' Sweet Bird of Youth was an incredible challenge uh, because she goes through a journey every night of feeling lost and hopeless uh, and then finding who she is and becoming this warrior princess at the end. And it was an amazing thing to play and also to give voice to women my age who are mostly forgotten in films. That's what's so wonderful about independent film and now about cable television is that women like me uh, have still a voice in characters that we play. We're not just relegated to play someone's mother who has a scene in the very beginning, who's mean or nice, um, usually one or the other. Um, and so this, th this, uh, these, these films and this, these works of art, I believe, like Tennessee Williams has done, Blanche Dubois and all of these great characters, that we still can have validity, we still can have something, we do have something to say, and this is a great character to say it through. But you played, and as you were telling me, just going over the, the, the playwrights you've worked with, whose material you've done, you played so many iconic characters, so many bigger than life characters. Yes. You like that too, don't you? Oh yes. I love to make people laugh. I really do. I, 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 I think that um, that was one of the great things about Sex in the City, is that it took subject matter, sexuality, women's sexuality, and it sort of blew the door off of it. And the way it did was, was, was through humor. And I think that coming out of really a decade and a half of fear of sexuality, mostly because of the outbreak of AIDS, uh, it was fantastic timing. We needed it. We needed a message that sex is, is not just about death. It's about life and expression and, and love fun. and fun. Yes, fun and humor. I remember being in a supermarket by the fish counter and this man coming up to me says, you know, you allowed me to talk to my 14-year-old daughter about sex. I said, you're welcome. I didn't know what else to say. <laughs> I guess, yes, you're welcome, you know. And he said, because your character was so bold and brave and wonderful, 
um, that, you know, I needed to address it because she was going to see the show already, you know, um, because kids do that, you know, uh, they, they get it's television. It's television. It's, yeah. You're now part of the culture in a way yes. that will never go away. Yes. yes. What is that like for you now? Because you, you clearly oh. didn't have any idea when you were starting to do it, did you? It's, it's a fantastic gift to be known to play a character who was a game changer for women. And the last film that, you know, that we did, or the second last film that we did, uh, Samantha had a birthday party and she was turning 50. Now this to be celebrated in an American film is unheard of. Usually a 50-year-old woman is la locking herself in the toilet and crying. Um, but here it was, I'm 50 and I'm fucking fabulous. You know, it was great, really great. Really great. And I think that that kind of impact has really lasted, made, it, made an impression on me on the kind of roles, not just for the people, the fans, and the people who like to watch my work and are looking out to see what I'm doing next, is to continue to break down barriers, first about women, and then about women as they age.